Okay. And so I think we have um, our first speaker was going to join uh, pretty close to the start time. So I'm going to go ahead uh, and tell you a little bit about SAGE. So, um, so the SAGE journey is a program whose mission is to inspire and encourage students to explore STEM careers for their future. Uh, we do this by offering free summer camps, paid internships, professional growth sessions, and other opportunities to connect with professionals who care about you and your future, and also to connect with your peers. And so, for example, at this um, Sage Live, we have one of our former campers uh, here to connect with you and share her story. Um, Sage Live, uh, we do these uh, every month or so, is part of the Sage journey. Uh, it's an online gathering of students who have attended the summer camp. Um, or apply to the summer camp and are curious about the next stages in their SAGE journey. Uh, it's also a time to reconnect with SAGE volunteers. Um, like I said, it's held monthly between August and May, and the topics that we cover are relevant to your journey, uh, whether it's career related, such as designing your life, resume workshops, um, or just kind of sharing some new and exciting uh, STEM topics like quantum computing, uh, AI, and machine learning. Um, and I do not see Finny, so the I'm going to tell you all a little about myself and uh, my journey. Um, I, uh, so I went to, for college, um, Rice University in Houston, Texas, where I double majored in astrophysics and religious studies. Um, the religious studies I had, I focused on Tibetan Buddhism, which was really cool. Um, so yeah, so if you if you have like you don't have to just be hardcore one hundred percent into STEM, um, you know you can do multiple things. Um, and then I went to graduate school at uh, The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, where I got my PhD in physics. Um, and then I went to one to um, SLAC, uh, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, uh, which is a Department of Energy National Lab out in uh, near Stanford, out in Palo Alto, or I guess Menlo Park technically. Um, and then, so I did what was called a postdoc. So that's postdoctoral. So after your doctorate, and it's a temporary research position where you are supposed to demonstrate and work as a independent researcher. And if you're doing an academic path, usually you'll do two or three postdocs and then try and then apply for like a permanent job as say a professor at a research university or teaching university if you want. Um, so then after Slack, I went to Los Alamos as a postdoc. And I loved Los Alamos. It's, it's really a great little town. Um, and my group at the lab is super supportive, really good vibes, lots of great people that I work with. And so I was like, I kind of want to stay at Los Alamos and they made me a permanent staff member. So I've been staff for about five years now. Um, I work in the physics division, so I am a physicist. Um, I do think that the, the national lab was kind of a better fit for me than say being a professor uh, because I get to focus on research. Uh, I wasn't terribly, interested in, you know, having to do lots of lectures and, you know, designing and running a class um, in addition to research, I do like to connect with students. And so you can do that at a national lab. And I've done that at Los Alamos and it's really more of a one-on-one -on -one kind of personal connection. And so I kind of prefer that over being a professor over like a large lecture hall of a hundred people that I never get to know. Uh, 
Okay. Well, anyway, uh, thank you for listening to me talk about myself. I do see that Vinny is here. Um, and so our first speaker is going to be Vinny Gupta. Uh, Vinny is president and co-founder of Upward Path Institute, headquartered in Palo Alto. The mission of the Institute is to prepare students for standing out in college admissions and careers. Yeah. Currently, 1,300 students from across the nation are enrolled in Upward Path Institute. Uh, Vinny's considered a thought leader in college admissions and parenting, and he's been featured in national media and is a frequent guest on media stations nationally. So I'm going to hand it on over to Vinny. Take it away. Hi, Andrea. Uh, thank you for uh, having me and nice to meet all these uh, amazing, uh, amazing young women. Uh, uh, so let me just adjust my screen so that I can try to see as many of them as I can. Okay, hi, Daniela. All right, so, okay, so looks like we have a full house here. So that is exciting. Uh, so what I'm going to do um, is, uh, I'm gonna give you guys a overview of college admissions in terms of what your options are. And for those of you that somehow feel that you or your family cannot afford colleges. I wanted to give you a different way of thinking so that uh, you don't, uh, how, do you, how do I do a nice word? You, that you don't kill your dreams uh, 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 without even trying them out first, right? So I just wanted to give you a different way of thinking about that, hey, there is lots of hope and optimism in terms of what kind of colleges are available to you. Okay, and then uh, looks like Daniela, there are a lot of audience questions. Uh, and would you be moderating those or, or, or are we gonna have an open floor where students can ask questions? I mean, so we're gonna, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. You, you... Oh, I was just gonna say, we're, we, we are asking people to write questions in chat. We do have some questions that were submitted beforehand. Um, so if at the end um, you want to take the questions, we'll help moderate. Um, but if you wanted to, if you have different sections and you want to stop and ask for questions, we can always, you know, switch into that. Um, so just we'll follow your lead. Okay, sounds good. All right. Okay, so give me a second. Let me share my screen. Okay, so students, I promise that I'm not going to do what, what my kids make fun of me. It's like, dad, no PowerPoint or no death by PowerPoint. So, so none of that here. It'll be just few slides. So let's start with what are your options? For, so there are close to about 4,500 or 5,000 colleges in the United States about 2,000 of them are community colleges, two-year two -year programs. This is after high school. And there are about 3,000 four-year colleges. Yes, actually 3,000, that many of them. Uh, now, most of you are probably, depending on the states that you are living in, you're probably familiar with what, what I call your in-state public universities. Public universities meaning that they're funded by the taxpayer, your parents, for example, and uh, they are generally significantly cheaper for students from that state. Now, keep in mind that if you're applying to, uh, because one of your one of our speakers today, uh, Greg, uh, he is at University of New Mexico. Keep in mind that if you are a California or a Tennessee student applying for his university you're probably not going to be getting the same low tuition that a University of New Mexico student will pay. You'll actually pay significantly higher or not have any spots for you. So what are the different options? Two-year community college options, where generally speaking, there is other than completing your high school graduation, 
you have no other requirements. Every student will get in and they are the cheapest option for attending college. And depending on the state that you are in, you could get significant tuition waivers, even on community college. So this is your cheapest option. Most students that attend a community college would actually be living at home, which means that your, your family is not paying additional cost for room and board. So this is your cheapest option. For those of you that actually aspire to a four-year college and beyond, if you take the two-year community college options, most states will give some kind of a preferential treatment if you were to apply to a public university in that state. So it could be a either just two years or a two-year at a community college plus another two years at your public university for a total of four years. This is going to be your cheapest option. And other than high school graduation, there is no other requirement. And for your family, this is the cheapest option. Now, the next option would be your public universities in state. So, Gregory, in a few minutes, he's going to be talking about University of New, Mex New Mexico. I live in California where we've got two different types of universities. University of California, these are what are called research universities or University of Texas or University of Michigan. These are, or University of Virginia, University of Washington. These are research universities that are generally more difficult to get in. These are four-year programs. The tuition is heavily discounted for students from that state. But for students coming from other states, they will be quite expensive. But most states would have uh, two different tiers. A research university tier, which is a lot more expensive, more difficult to get into, and a lower tier, which are typically called teaching universities. Like in California, these are California state universities. Easier to get in, cheaper to attend. So this is a big option. So in terms of cost of paying for all this, cheapest would be a community college. The next one would be a teaching university in your college. In general, if paying for college is a challenge for you and your family, I would not recommend that you consider out-of-state public universities, meaning that don't go out of, out of your state to another state because they'll be very expensive for you. And they generally don't have the money to, they don't have financial aid or those kind of things for out-of-state students. These public universities, Generally speaking, they admit out-of-state students because they want more tuition from you. So the corollary of that is it's not going to be cheap for you. Now, the third thing, the biggest group of colleges are these public, excuse me, private colleges and universities. Most of you might have heard of these Ivy League universities. These are all on the East Coast, Harvard, or Princeton, or Yale, or Brown, Columbia. There are eight of them but there are about maybe 15 or 20 others that are similarly reputed, similarly expensive, and similarly difficult to get into. These are these Ivy or Ivy Plus colleges. These are the most difficult to get into universities in the country. We broadly call them top 30 colleges or universities, top 30 ranked colleges or universities. But here comes the catch here, that there are maybe 2,500 plus other public, excuse me, private colleges and universities in the country. What does private mean? That there is the, the taxpayer, your parents are not paying anything towards this. So private colleges and universities are typically a lot more expensive than your in-state public university. But private universities or private colleges, they give you so many other options. For example, if you had a GPA of 2.2, which is barely passing, there is a college even for you. So that there are so many such private universities and colleges. If 
your family is struggling with paying for college, I would not recommend that you spend time on this particular group of thousands of other colleges. Why? They are businesses. I mean, they educate, but, but they are businesses and they have no other source of funding other than your tuition. So generally speaking, they will be a lot more expensive. So if I try to summarize all this, if paying for college is not a constraint, then all these options are for you. But if paying for college is a constraint, then in that case, your cheapest option would be a two-year community college option. When I say cheapest option, cost of college has three components, guys, three pieces. The first is tuition. The second is cost of living, if you are living away from home. And the third is food, right? So with a community college, you're typically living at home. So the room and board, living and food expenses, they are pretty low, right? Uh, uh, and you're paying a very low tuition. So this is your cheapest option. So don't ignore it. The other option that if that the other option, the second one would be actually your in-state public university, especially a teaching university. And when Gregory from University of New Mexico comes in, please ask him questions about financial aid available from his types of colleges. That will be your next level. Now, here comes something really interesting, which might give you guys lots of optimism. You might think that these IVs and Ivy League type colleges and universities, you might think that they're really expensive and I should not even apply. So let me give you a interesting secret about these people. These top 30 private universities, the key, key term guys is private university, not public. In most cases, they have a lot of money sitting around. So if you are a deserving student that they want, and if you cannot truly afford it, and they all have their different ways of looking at your family's financial situation, then there's just plenty of money available. In a weird way, if I can joke about it, the less money, <clears throat> excuse me, the less money you and your family make, the higher the chances are that you will get a full ride into one of these top private universities. Obviously, you need to be competitive enough to get in. And I'll talk about that in a few slides, in the next few slides. But I don't want you guys to self-reject some of these Ivy League type colleges because you think, oh my gosh, the tuition fee is $70,000. Add room and board and it's $90,000. There is no way I'm applying or getting in. What I'm saying to you is that, again, jokingly, the less money your family makes, the higher the chances that you will get a full right to these places, right? Now, full right doesn't mean that they will pay for room and board. Full right typically mean, means a tuition waiver. Unfortunately, you'll still have to figure out how to pay for room and board, but there are ways to do this. We cannot cover all of this, but at least tuition, if you think you can, you can get into Harvard, which I'll talk about in a minute, don't let affordability keep you back. Okay, any, are there any burning questions at this time which can't wait? Uh, what I'm gonna do now is to jump into what do colleges actually look for in terms of admitting you? Andrea, yeah, it doesn't look like we have any questions in chat, so go ahead and okay. uh, keep going, I guess. All right. So now the next thing I want to talk about is what are colleges looking for? So again, we need to look at not all colleges are the same. So let's start with community colleges, easy ones, just graduate from high school. <laughs> Nothing else, right? That's all that they're looking for now. Let's look at the bottom here. Uh, let's look at non-selective state universities. What does non-selective state universities mean? That they're much easier to get in. The acceptance rate, meaning your chance of getting in is, is 80%, 90%, 100% at times. They're almost formulaic, meaning that all they look for is your academic credentials. GPA, and a lot of times they will look at the rigor of courses that they have taken. 
but it's purely academic based. And in some cases, in some cases, they will look at your SAT or ACT. They do not look at your extracurriculars. They will not have a college essay. These are very simple, straightforward applications. Again, ask uh, uh, Gregory from University of New Mexico. He can talk a little bit more because his admissions are in this group, right? So here, if the question is, Mr. Gupta, what can I do to be competitive? Study hard, right? Get good grades and try to take as many rigorous honors or uh, AP uh, advanced placement type courses if your school offers them, okay? So that's easy. Now, moving up to selective state universities like University of California or uh, uh, University of North Carolina, UNC, or University of Michigan, if affordability is an, is an issue, if your state does not have such a university, and if affordability is an issue, don't go here. Like I said, don't apply to these out-of-state public universities. They will be very expensive. They have no money available to give you financial aid. But what they are looking for, they almost behave like the Ivy type private universities. And I'll come to that. Now, private colleges, before we talk about the Ivy League types, private colleges, the 2,500 plus private colleges, they behave in different ways. Some of the ones with really high acceptance rates, they will behave like non-selective state universities where all that they care about is academics. Some of them may ask you for extracurriculars and essays. So now let's talk about the ones that are the most competitive because if you prepare for the most competitive, you will be ready for everything else. That the, the way I like to present it is that if you actually prepare to go to the moon, literally, right? Even if you don't go to the moon, you'll actually be much higher than the Earth's, you know, the surface that you're standing on. So this one, the Ivy League type, is like going to the moon. You're preparing, for, you're setting the highest bar for yourself, okay? So for those of you that feel it in you to compete at this level, if you prepare here, everything else takes care of itself because everything else here is less than that. So what are these colleges looking for? I'll let you, I'll give you 30 seconds to read this. What we have here are the top private universities in the country and U University of California, Berkeley, which is a very reputed public university out of, out of California. I just read this University of Southern California, private university, read the one in red, go to Harvard, read University of Pennsylvania, and then close at Berkeley. Now take a minute to read, and I will be right back. Okay, um, if you guys, uh, so if you guys are done reading this, I know there's a lot of content. Let me try to summarize this. If, so what are we trying to read here? These are universities in the top 30 in the country. The, the Ivy League types, Harvard and University of Pennsylvania and University of Southern California, which is what, which is what we call an Ivy Plus highly competitive and all of that stuff. And University of California, Berkeley is currently ranked number two public university in the whole country. What are they looking for? And here, students, what you see here is gonna surprise you in most cases, because you might think that all that I have to do is to work on academics, but what are they saying? Let's look at Harvard. When reading an application, we get to know the person behind the numbers. So Rhea, I can see you on my video. So if I can just use you as an example, not to pick on you. When reading an application, if I were Harvard, we get to know Rhea Aswin, the person behind the numbers. Your 
GPA is very important. If they take SAT, it's important. But outside that, they want to look at your extracurricular activities. But also, very importantly, Rhea and students, this is really important to understand who you are as a person in terms of your personal qualities. What are the examples of personal quality? And some of you, I'm sure everyone has personal qualities, guys. You need to figure out which ones do you have? What are the examples? Teamwork and collaboration. Especially you guys are all STEM, right? Primarily, and Andrea, correct me if I'm wrong, right? In STEM-oriented careers, colleges are increasingly looking for collaboration and teamwork as well. They're not just looking for you to be really smart at coding or uh, whatever, or math or whatever you do. Resourcefulness or emotional resiliency, meaning that faced with difficulties in your life, how did you respond? These are unique personal qualities, kindness, empathy, all of it, right? So this is part of you as a person. And what unique life experiences have you had which influenced who you have become? Again, faced with adverse life experiences, how did you respond to it? So University of Pennsylvania, we encourage you to reflect on yourself, your community, and your interest, your voice, not parents, your voice, and your experiences matter, and we can't wait to hear your story. Harvard, we look forward to learning more about you. University of Southern California, remember there is a person, Rhea, on the other end of your application. We're just trying to get to know you. None of this is to say that your academics is not important. At this level of competition, your unweighted GPA would have to be somewhere in the 3.9, 3.84 range. None of this is to say that you can ignore academics, but at this level of competition, you'll need to have very strong academics and ex extracurricular activities, but also a keen sense of awareness of yourself. If you ask me, Mr. Gupta, for these kinds of colleges, what is the single most important consideration? With the gray hair that I have and doing this for 10 years, I would simply say that the students that get into these kind of programs, they're academically very strong, but they're also very self-aware. So what does, what does self-awareness mean? These are some of the questions that you might want to think of. And if we had more time, just for fun, I would ask uh, uh, your host today, Andrea, uh, or someone like that, just for fun's sake, I would say, can you answer these questions, right? Just for the sake of fun, right? The, the point I'm trying to make is that these are not easy questions even for adults, even for people my age, even for people at 75. Like questions like, why am I unique outside my straight, for, straight A? Very difficult, right, Rhea? If you try to answer these kind of questions, because you would tend to, your answers typically would respond to, what have I done? So typically what would students say? I'm a straight A student. I can do multiple things at once. I'm really hardworking, et cetera, et cetera. But none of those are unique. So what makes you unique, right? Uh, so like, for example, if somebody were to ask me, Mr. Gupta, why do you think you're unique? A, I would say that at your age, I had no idea. Except that you, the, the world that you live in is becoming so much more competitive that you need to answer this question at 17 when I didn't, when I didn't have to answer it until 50. Well, what would I say? I would simply say that I'm a highly empathetic individual who is deeply impacted by suffering of others. And I have a unique ability to make connections with most humans. Stop. That's how I am unique. I'm not going to talk about anything else, right? Just to give you an example, right? Then there are a lot of these other questions, right? So let me start wrapping up and start taking questions. Uh, so this is at this level of competition, that's what you're looking at. So 
let's let spend a few minutes uh, on or just a couple of minutes on hardware. There is no formula to getting here. You do your best to apply. You tell your story in the most authentic manner. Then let them figure out whether they think there's a good fit. Academics is important, but they also look at extracurricular activities done in a particular manner. Community involvement is huge to most of these colleges. Le extracurricular activities, participation is important, but what they rather see additionally is leadership and distinction. So marching band is great, but can you do some leadership position in marching, marching band? Student, being in a student body, participation is good, but can you do leadership? But Guys, I cannot overemphasize the value of personal qualities, character, right? I'm sure you have all of this stuff, but can you please spend the time to talk to yourself? Look inside and say, which of these personal qualities do I have? And because among other things in 12th grade, when you apply to these colleges, they'll be looking for people, your teachers, counselors, community leaders to actually give you reference or talk about you through recommendation letters. So this is how you look at these colleges. Uh, uh, Danielle, I still have a few minutes. We're doing okay on time? We are, we are okay on time. If you wanna start taking questions, that would be okay. Yeah, so maybe just a couple minutes. I just wanted to summarize this. So as you think about competing at this level of colleges, guys, what we call top 30 colleges, top 30 colleges, about 25 of these are these Ivy League type private universities, and about four or five are top ranked public universities. Example, UCLA, UC Berkeley, these are both in California. What are they looking for? This is directly from the colleges. So, just focus for now as to what they think are very important. Ignore these other areas, or actually you might just wanna look at this also important, the second column. This stuff, ignore it for now. Why am I presenting this slide? Because a lot of you, because of lack of information, may be spending a lot of time here, and I'd like you to spend time here. So what are they looking for? GPA. And Ria might say, duh, Mr. Gupta. And I would say, totally duh. This is college admissions. So GPA is absolutely important. Rigor of your course selection. And app your college application essay. It's just becoming so much important, these essays. So keep in mind that uh, all of the stuff that I talked about, self-awareness, most of this stuff you will talk about through college essays. So please don't wait till 12th grade, fall and say, I'm gonna start working on my college essay because college essays are not just about writing. The question is, do you know what to write about? Right, so Ria, the question for you would be, hi, I'm Ria. I have a really strong GPA, but this is how I'm unique outside academics. And I would bet that right now, if I were to ask you this question, it's a very difficult question, right, Ria? Okay, so now let's go to a non-academic, extracurricular activities, we've talked about that. But guys, look at this, isn't this a thing of beauty? Unique talents and abilities outside academics. Think about what you guys have, right? I would bet that every one of you has something unique here. It's just that, are you aware of it? And then, character and personal quality. So don't ignore the person behind the application. If I can just say this to illustrate this last point in a lighthearted manner without offending anyone, imagine that you guys were going on a date, right? Would you go into the date and start saying that I have a 3.7 GPA and my SAT scores were 1460? How quickly will that date end, right? That is what college admissions at this level are all about. You do need that strong SAT and GPA, which is here, but don't ignore this. This is dating. Okay, so 
keep let's uh, so with that, let me just summarize what all I covered and then we'll jump to questions. We talked about your different college options in the country. There is a, what's the key message? Guys, there is a college for every one of you. The cheapest way to attend college would be a two-year community college leading into a transfer, but don't ignore the huge amounts of money sitting with these uh, really reputed private universities. So don't disqualify yourself by thinking you cannot apply. So I'm sending you a lot of message of optimism and hope that if you build your good credentials, there's a lots of options, right? Third point was that different colleges look for different things. And if you can, if you want to prepare, prepare for these top 30 type colleges, because if you prepare for that, you've raised such a high bar for yourself that you'll be ready for everything else. Those are my key messages for you. And with that, we can start taking questions. Daniela, how would you want me to do this? Should I just go through this list? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, yeah, we, we have time for maybe uh, two questions. And I think some of these are clarifying the terms you used, like tag. Um, are you going to, can you like maybe respond to those in chat after we move on to Greg? Sure. And maybe we maybe I can try to find some that would, you know, maybe benefit from a bit more elaboration and discussion on your part. Sure. Um, let's see. Is is there a minimum uh, GPA that Ivy's ex like yeah. is there is there a cutoff in GPA at the Ivy level? Yeah, excellent question. There is no cutoff that they mentioned, but based on this year college uh, admission results that are there, we are generally of the opinion that an unweighted GPA of 3.8 or so would pretty much be the minimum to put you in the playing field. Uh, uh, below that, I'm not saying that at 3.7, you cannot try, but I would say in general, Remember guys, unweighted is what I'm talking about. In general, I would say below 3.8 for Ivy League type colleges will be a huge challenge. Yeah, thanks. I think that's a really good answer. Um, I remember when I was applying for colleges, I ended up going to uh, Rice University, which is a pretty prestigious school. Um, but they had on their website, we are not looking for just valedictorians. We want the future leaders um, of the of the world. So yeah, but I do think you're right. You, you definitely want to be in the high threes. Yeah. And um, if I can, if I can very quickly add to it. Of course. If, University of Southern California, which is currently ranked 22 or 23, this year they did not admit anyone other than straight A. Uh, but this year was a, is probably the most competitive year ever. When you guys apply, who knows? It might get easier. Right, let's stay optimistic. But the point I'm trying to make to Andrea's point that GPA is required, but we also had the student uh, who actually in the high school journey had two Bs and a C. But this kid, he finally got into University of Chicago, which is ranked number six. My own son went there. This guy, when you talk to him, he was he just brought to the surface so much passion and a sense of purpose about life and the extracurricular activities that he had done, they were so unique that he got in in spite of those two Bs and a C, right? So, so again, to Andrea's point, holistic admissions don't ignore the power of the person. Andrea? No, that's great advice. Um, we had another question that I'm curious about too. Um, schools that don't officially require the SAT, is it still kind of like unofficially important in the application? You know what I mean? Yeah, so there are, A, this is all very confusing uh, to students. Uh, so there are different ones. Uh, the, there, are school, there are colleges that simply do not consider them at all period. Uh, their application will have no room for it, like University of California or California State University. In some cases, it's optional. Optional essentially means that you, if you wanted, you can 
put in your scores and if they wanted, if, if they think that they needed to consider your score to make a more informed decision, they can consider it. Uh, there is a third category where it's mandatory. You will need to provide it and they will consider it. Uh, so awesome. if they're all, all very confusing, the best way to do that is to go to the website of that college and to see what they're looking for. All right, thank you. I think we're going to move on to our next speaker. But if you have time, Vinny, to hang out in chat and look at some of the questions um, and answer them, that would be fantastic. So we're going to uh, now introduce our second speaker, uh, Greg Scargill. Uh, Greg is originally from Santa Fe and has deep and broad New Mexico roots. Uh, he can even trace his New Mexico heritage back to Spanish explorers in the late 16th century. That's pretty wild. Uh, he started his adult life as a U.S. Navy hospital um, corpsman for the Marines. Uh, after five years of service, he settled in California to start a promotional product company and was very successful. But 2008 uh, led his company into hard times. Um, he wants to just, in sharing this, demonstrate that he has experience with success and failure and knows uh, steps to recover from you know stumbles. Uh, I know what it means to suffer, but also what it means to heal. Um, and he's also, uh, his road to healing included a courageous step of giving up alcohol. And he has celebrated, or this summer he's celebrating his 12th year of sobriety. Yay, good job, Greg. Um, we're all very, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Greg earned three college degrees in his 30s. So he's kind of telling you that it's never too late. Um, an associate's degree from Santa Fe Community College, bachelor's and MBA from Highlands University. Uh, Greg wants families to know that higher education is not just for recent high school graduates, like I said. Uh, while he was working on his own education, he built the Veterans Resource Center at Santa Fe Community College, uh, which came to be ranked first in the nation. Military Times chose Santa Fe Community College as best for veterans uh, while the center was under Greg's leadership. Uh, his goal at the University of New Mexico is to let families know that college is accessible for many people who think it will be too expensive. Uh, the image people have of college is something that is really expensive um, and University of New Mexico has programs to allow New Mexicans of all ages to go to college with little or no cost. Uh, he has a passion for higher education and really and with a focus on the student experience. So Greg, take it away. Thank you so much, Andrea. How's all of the incredible students and families doing? Type of one, if you're doing great today, it's a beautiful day where you're at. Type of one in the chat. Let's get some feedback. I know we are so thankful for Vinny and all of that incredible information. I have a question for you. I like to get feedback. So in the chat, on a scale from one to five, five being very stressed out and one being not stressed at all, where are you in regards to applying to college and university? Are you super stressed out or not even stressed at all? One to five. Awesome, thank I'm you so much. High numbers. I totally I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of high numbers too, Andrea. Yeah, yeah, it is it is a stressful, it's a huge transition, you guys. It's such a huge transition. Ladies, and the cool thing about it, right? I'm going to, can I give you guys a secret? Do you guys want a secret today? But make sure that you share it with everyone else that you know, that's also stressed out going to high school. Is college is not harder. It's not harder. It's not harder than high school. How many of you guys believe me? Type a one if you believe me. Type a two if you think that's cap. <laughs> So 
So the reason why you guys, right, from kindergarten to 12th grade, did you have to go to school? Are you being forced to go there? Yes, you don't got you don't really don't have an option. Now here's a question for you. Again, type a one if if this is a yes, type a two if it's no. When you graduate from high school, are you a doctor? Yes, one, no, two. When you graduate from high school, are you a astrophysicist? Type one if that's a yes or two if it's a no. So here's the trick. The reason why college is not harder, it should be more fun. Because in all of the education you've received up until this point, kindergarten through 12th grade, it's kind of a forced system. It's kind of our, our general system of creating uh, logic and thinking and critical thinking and problem solving and reading and writing and comprehension. But when you get plugged into the universities and the colleges, hopefully you're, you're going to show up one, because you want to, you don't have to, do you have to apply to Harvard, Columbia, Yale, Stanford? You don't have to. But when you want to apply to that, hopefully you're going to be aligned with something that you're really interested in. And when you're interested in passion and, and you feel passionate about learning about a subject, then it shouldn't be harder. It should actually be funner. And so hopefully just that alone reduces your stress just a little bit. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to help you reduce your stress even a little bit more. Are you guys ready for that? Type a one if it's a yes. Type a two if it's a no. Who here wants to reduce their stress right here, right now? And I have a powerful way of doing that. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Type a one. If it's a yes. Yeah, I, I can see it. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Let's get into this. I don't want to lose you guys, so I might stay on just this page right here versus the present. Okay, now I got everybody. All right, well, greetings again. I'm so honored to be here. My name is Gregory Scargo. I do work at the University of New Mexico. We have a branch campus in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Who's seen the movie Oppenheimer? Right, type a one if that's a yes. Type a two if that's no. If it's no, that's okay too. It's an interesting movie in an interesting town. Um, but it is an honor to be here. And... I am so grateful to be able to share with you guys some pretty important strategies and insights for young women applying for school. And before we get started, I wanted to do something that's really important to me, which is visualize. And it's a part of my daily practice, mindfulness. Are you, is anybody here familiar with mindfulness practices? Type a one if that's a yes, type a two if it's a no. You can even share some of your daily practices, but I practice meditation and breath work and journaling every single day. And here are some of the benefits. It reduces stress and improves your sleep, reduces anxiety, Increases your energy, improves self-esteem, boosts your focus, reduces depression, improves awareness, and increases energy and improves your mood. All amazing things. And so if I could get everybody to stand up, I bet most of you are sitting down, right? If I can get you to stand up, and if you can hear me, that's perfect. I am going to ask you to stand up. And just gently close your eyes, and I want you to connect with your breathing for just a moment. I want you to just breathe in through your nose, softly, slowly, just breathing in through your nose. Maybe just pause for just a moment, holding your breath, that life force energy. And I want you to release your breath and release 
all of your breath. And you can even make a little whooshing sound and I'll demonstrate. So you're going to breathe into your nose. Hold. Just get it all out. And do that. Just start connecting with your breath. With your eyes gently closed, just start connecting with your breath. If there's any parents involved that are listening in on this incredible conversation today, please feel free to join in with us. Visualization is such a powerful technique. But right now, we're just focusing on our breath. We're not worried about school. We're not worried about class. We're not worried about assignments. We're just breathing. The most basic aspect of life is to breathe. Breathe in through our nose and out through our mouth. And as you just start to connect, as that breath goes in through your nose, in through your nostrils, down through your throat, into filling your lungs, just hold that life force energy inside of yourself for just a moment and release. And I want you to breathe in one more time and I want you to hold it. Five, four, three, two, one, release. And I want you to just allow for your breath to continue focusing on that. And I want you to visualize real quick. I want you to visualize yourself sending out an application to attend the number one school on your list. I want you to see yourself typing out and writing an essay in your room, in that place where you feel safe, where you feel confident, where you rest at night. And I want you to just see yourself And I want you to see yourself dropping that in a mailbox. And then I want to see yourself now receiving a letter in the mail. But this is not any letter. I want you to visualize receiving a letter with a letterhead from the most unbelievable school that you can even imagine. And before you picture what that letter says on it, I want you to tell yourself that money is not an issue, that your upbringing is not an issue, that your grades, your experiences, all of the, the things that could cause the stress, I want you to just see that school that is your dream, that is your vision, sending you a letter of acceptance. And if it's your parents that hand you the letter, I want you to see that exchange and that excitement and as you open up that letter, I want you to see and then visualize the words, congratulations. And next to that is your name. You have been accepted. And I want you to feel what that feeling is like. How would it feel to be accepted by your dream school? And I want to fast forward to you finishing your high school journey. And I want you to visualize stepping on to that dream campus for the first time. I want you to see the trees, the buildings, the grass. Is there wildlife around there. I want you to visualize what does that campus look like in inside of your heart, inside of your mind. I want you to see your fellow students. 
I want you to smell the smells of the air. And I want you to just connect with how would that feel? Stepping onto that campus, not as a visitor, but as a student. Just enjoy that feeling for just a moment. As we just come back down, take one last breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. If you haven't already, feel free to open up your eyes. Start to appreciate the space that you're in. Appreciate this incredible technology that we can now use to connect. It's the second greatest gift of life is connection. And you are now connected. You have a vision. You have a dream. And I want to tell you about the importance of visualization. And after this session, or if you play it back, I want you to write down what you visualized. And I want you to know that that vision was only yours. What you saw, where you went, was only your vision. And so we should have 30 some different answers. And that's inside of you. Now, oftentimes our dreams exceed our current state of reality. And here's a hint. It's not your responsibility to try and piece together logically, how is this going to work out? Vinny talked a lot about that. Like, it's okay to dream. And it's even more important to take actions on the dream. Because in, it's really true in life. You see, you see people interviewing, uh, you know, <clears throat> people in their 60s and 70s on, on TikTok all the time. And they always say, what's the thing you regret the most? And it's, it's not the things they did. It's that they didn't do something when they had a chance. It's wishing that they would have applied to that school or, you know, ask that person out, whatever it is. There's so many opportunities that we have in life. And so what is your responsibility is for you to trust your vision and act on the opportunities that present themselves along your journey. And so we don't we we did realize that there was a lot of questions about how to pay for this stuff or how to get free ride scholarships. And so I'm here to talk about money. I'm here to talk about scholarships. Is anybody excited about that? Type of one if you're excited to hear more about scholarships. Type of two if you're like, nah, uh I I, I don't I don't have no interest in, in the money part. So I'm seeing a lot of ones, and that's a good thing. I'm seeing Charlene with a lot of ones. She's all about that money. So understanding scholarships can be very stressful. The sooner you get started, identifying good, reliable scholarships, the better. And then you can now develop a winning strategy that can set you up for success. So that's a big part of believing in your dream is how to pay for it. So I'm going to give you five winning strategies for scholarships. Number one, you need to look local. A lot of times we don't realize we, you know, we have the access to the world here and we start doing searches and all this stuff starts popping up everywhere. And we forget that there's scholarships right there in your local community, businesses locally that want to support you along your academic journey. It's an incredible thing. And I'm someone that has had many scholarships along my college path. You want to prioritize scholarships, number two. Number three, you want to create a deadline calendar. Number four, you want to avoid scams. Who here is easily scammed? You believe everything you see. <laughs> Send me $20 and I'm going to give you $10,000 for your scholarship. <laughs> Who here is easily scammed? <laughs> And fifth, you're going to want to polish your social media footprint. I'm going to go into detail on all of these, so don't be so stressed out. So first up, 
we want to look local. Things that you can do is you can ask school staff about local scholarships. Now that's at your current school and that's also at a future school that you're wanting to visit. They have lots and lots and lots of resources. And that's something that I think you young ladies that have already been really active and even just a part of the SAGE program, you know, it's advocating for yourself, speaking up when you know there's interest and curiosity. It's a beautiful thing. So make sure that you're asking about scholarships that are in your own community. You want to reach out and check with college financial aid officers. These, these folks are usually really busy, but they're also kind of an afterthought. We get so stressed out about the application process and the admissions and what classes to us to take that we kind of forget about the financial aid officer. And those are very reliable people that work on every single college campus across this country and around the world. So you definitely want to reach out to the financial aid officer. You also want to do keyword searches for things that apply to you. There's scholarships for literally everything and anything nowadays. If you're a woman scholarship, ethnicity-based scholarships, focus of study, if you have statuses like you're a veteran dependent or maybe you have a, a family member that worked uh, works for public government and there's specialized scholarships for that. So it's it's thinking outside of the box and knowing that there's a lot of opportunities out there for you. So start local and then expand beyond. You want to identify and prioritize your the scholarship list as you start to find stuff. So start a Google Word doc or whatever kind of digital document that you feel comfortable with, but you want to keep a list, copy and paste the links, and definitely you need to know when the deadlines are. Then you want to create a rank system, which is the most promising scholarships. Then so that you can build some confidence along this journey, you want to apply for the easiest ones. There are some scholarships that's literally just one page long and needs like a like a short synopsis type, like five paragraph essay, if even that, maybe just a paragraph because it's more based on your connections of, of like I said, like I was able to get a veteran scholarship. My children are going to get veteran scholarship. And I am a father. My daughter's a se senior this year and a sophomore. And so they know that there's scholarships available to them just based on that status. And it's not lengthy. So if you can find low hanging fruit scholarships locally, it, it all matters. It all matters. So look for which ones are easiest and start applying for those first. Then you also want to have someone else check your application before you ship it off, right? Make sure you have a, a parent, an adult, a teacher, your counselor, just have someone get some feedback. And that's a really important task and in, in skill in life is to ask for feedback, to open yourself up, to not feel that it's all on you. And if you can't do this by yourself, that you're not good enough to do this. No, getting a second opinion about what you're about to submit is really, really an important skill for you to develop early in life. And so we want to create a, a scholarship deadline calendar. You all have smartphones, type of one if you have a smartphone. I think that's probably all of you. So you definitely want to once you have your list and once you've identified deadlines, you want to start adding those events into your calendar. And you also want to give yourself reminders because you get so busy with life and all the things you're doing. It's like, I have to remind myself to remind myself about the things I need to remember to do. Y'all probably aren't there yet, but trust me, if you're wanting to be successful, it's good to have reminders. Now that's the digital piece. I also recommend that you print out, there's a one page 12 month calendar on a piece of paper 
and you want to create little highlights and create yourself a little key so that you can post that up even in a few places, post it up on the, the refrigerator in the kitchen, post it up in your bathroom mirror, post it up in your room so that you continuously see that. You could even post one of the other really cool back to the visualization is post up, you know, get a, take a picture or download something to create a little vision board of the school you want to go to. And so having that there as well, so that you continue to see that vision and believe that it's going to happen. And thirdly, you want to be proactive. Submit this early. Do not put yourself in the pressure cooker where you're staying up till midnight on the due date and you still have to write an essay or you're still like, I wonder if my teacher will send me a recommendation letter on Sunday night at 1030 at night. So again, knowing your requirements, being organized and being proactive to submit these as soon as possible are all powerful and really uh, will strengthen your deal. And remember, don't miss the deadlines. Again, for those of you that get scammed easily, right? Here's, here's five things to look for so that you don't get scammed, right? Research scholarships thoroughly. Right. Don't just if you're going to like one of these main hubs of like scholarship uh, USA dot com or whatever it is. And they say we have all the scholarships here in one space where you apply once and you and it give you you'll apply to hundreds of scholarships. Don't just do that. Go to ones that get your attention and then do some research. Click on it. Do some research. And start following the course. Find out who is sponsoring that scholarship. Try and go to their homepage, their webpage to see if it's a valid thing, to see if due dates align, to see if it's an updated website or an old website. But do some research. Use reputable sources to find scholarships. Again, that's that local piece. Using people that this is their profession. Financial aid officers are really great at doing this. So finding reputable people to rely on. Be cautious with unsolicited scholarship offers. Here's the problem. We all know how this works. You start searching stuff and somehow I think it. And the next thing you know, I'm getting ads all day long about something I was thinking about, not even typing about. And so when you start getting all these things popping up, just be a little bit um, you know, hesitant. You can even be, you know, just not so sure about it. Just know the difference between unsolicited means it's coming for you and solicited is you're looking for it. You're actually shopping for scholarships. But when stuff starts popping up like spam and clickbait, just be, be wary of that. Pump the brakes just a little bit and do some due diligent research. A big one is if there's an application fee, it's a huge red flag. So just know that if someone's asking you for money to give you money, that's a little bit of a question mark, right? It kind of is counterintuitive, right? If they're saying, hey, we're here to give out money, why do they need money from the people that they're trying to get money from? They should have donors and people that are supporting these scholarships that they don't need you as an applicant to pay a fee. So that's just a red flag to be wary of. And beware of any scholarship that guarantees you. Apply and you are guaranteed, but then it asks for all this personal information. So that's just another kind of red flag for you to watch for. Now, this is an important piece, and we talked about it a little bit earlier. But here's the thing. Polish up your social media footprint. This number one is going to challenge most of you. Scholarships are not free money. It's not free money. They're an investment in you. And so the organizations that are willing to write you a check, big checks, little checks, give you money, that doesn't mean it's free, right? This is an opportunity that they are investing in your vision, your dream, because there are some really good people out there that say, you know what, if we invest in our youth and we invest in them and their dreams, then they're going to make this world a better place. So energetically, it's still an investment. And yet 
they they just like many businesses, just like even with dating and connecting with people, they do searches. And so it's really, really important that you're mindful of your social media footprint. Number two, always think long term before posting. You see it. We see it in the news all the time now where someone is having to answer for something they posted many, 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 many years ago. That feels like a whole nother lifetime that they should be absolved from. But it kind of showed someone's beliefs and they're now questionable. And so it's something that you just you need to be mindful of that scholarships, universities and business owners alike are going to look at your social media to see about your character. And is that the fullness picture of your character? No, but there could be some telltale signs. So just always think long-term. Keep personal information private. Apply the golden rule online. Someone posts, what is the golden rule? Does your generation still live by the golden rule? Anybody? Post it in the comments. What is the golden rule Are you guys searching Golden Rule? Great job, Sanja. Great job. Thank you so much. The Golden Rule is to treat others the way you want to be treated. Wouldn't that be a beautiful place? If we just all, if everybody just treated people with love and kindness and consideration and just understanding we're all going through something, we're all stressed out about one thing or another, but we're all humans. And that connection is a beautiful thing. So thank you for posting that, the golden rule. And then so you do want to avoid oversharing and you want to use audience filters because there is a good chance that before someone picks you, they might search you. I have a bonus. Full ride scholarships. Anybody want a full ride scholarship? Type of one if you want a full ride scholarship. <laughs> Right. We all want full ride scholarships. I got a full ride scholarship, if I'm honest. In my 30s, I was able to secure a full ride scholarship. But it was and it was in part because of the service I did to my country. It gave me a full ride scholarship. It paid for my books, my tuition, and even some living expenses. And I'm extremely grateful for that. But when we look at what universities and colleges of all types are looking for in terms of writing off your tuition. You know, you need to obviously, grades is going to matter. It is a competitive arena. So earning excellent grades matters. Taking challenging classes matter. You want to study and, and ho hopefully hit a home run on the SAT and the ACT. We mentioned it before. You want to take on leadership positions. Another piece that you could add in here is you want to volunteer. Go volunteer in your community. You start creating your resume of who you are. Are you giving back to your community, which volunteering is leadership? You want to make sure you apply to as many schools as possible. Don't don't just say, right, it's as Vinny mentioned earlier, don't cancel yourself. Give yourself an opportunity. Let them be the decision maker, not you. Your, your responsibility is to put forth the, the best application of you. Let someone else in an admissions office make the decision. Do not make that decision in your head. Start your scholarship search early. Most of y'all are going to do that today. I know it. Submit thoughtful application materials. And finally, a big piece that's available to all the youth, at least in New Mexico. I can't speak for all the other uh, states, but dual credit to start taking college classes now. Like I know a lot of people want to get into the AP classes, but I can tell you from my perspective, University of New Mexico, that if you have dual credit, that far, that is far superior, especially if it's core classes that are going to lead towards your degree, it accelerates your journey, especially if you're wanting to go far in higher education. You're wanting to go past a four-year degree into a graduate or a doctoral degree. You definitely want, if you can, 
to start taking dual credit, which is not taking all your high school and all your college. You take college classes that eliminate high school classes. And we already know that high school doesn't make you a doctor, but your college classes will, if that is your goal. And with that being said, that concludes my presentation. I thank you guys so much for being here. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them either here or later. There's my email if you want to reach out to me and I'll pass it back on to Andrea. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was great. And, and I think it was really important to put us all into a good mindset to receive that information. And so, you know, to don't, yeah, like, start things early, make a calendar with reminders. You know, you don't want to be writing these applications when you're stressed out and on a time, you know, and you've got to, got to get it done in two hours um, because these need to be thoughtful, mindful essays. Um, we do have a quick question if you can give a quick answer, but we do need to get to our, our third speaker. Um, someone was asking, how do you apply for full ride scholarships? Is it part of the application or something separate? Typically full ride scholarships are, are a part of the application process. Um, I think most of us are aware of, you know, collegiate athletes getting like full ride type scholarships, but definitely for academics, you can get it. And even what Vinny was mentioning earlier is if your family does, does like, isn't abundant, right? Isn't just filthy rich and able to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars, trust him, trust me and trust all the other people here today that that's not a point of, shame that's actually an opportunity for you to actually receive that extra support because we we don't want your current state of finances to be a restriction from you being able to access the highest quality of education so again just put all that aside trust the process and definitely um allow yourself to be accepted based yeah. on who you are today and Indy posted um, in the chat that there's a thing called Quest Bridge um, that you can check out for full ride scholarships outside of the university you're applying for. And, and so with that, um, we are going to move to Indy. Um, thank you, Greg, again. And our third speaker is going to be Indy uh, Desendiero Sloan. Uh, Sloan, sorry. Ugh. Um, and Indy is a native New Mexican, uh, is a rising sophomore at Caltech, majoring in physics. Uh, she has done research with the Institute for Computing in research on the effects of solar wind on the LISA Pathfinder. Uh, this past summer, she conducted research on the acceleration disks of black holes as part of the Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship Program at Caltech in the High Energy Astrophysics Group. Uh, outside of school, Indy is passionate about horses and is even bringing one with her to college. So go ahead, Indy, and take it away. So I don't have a presentation. I'm just going to talk about my journey in applying to college. Um, I didn't start till the winter of junior year. And I that spring, I went and visited two of the colleges I was interested in. Um, but I really didn't start thinking about what colleges I was going to apply to or any of that until the beginning of senior year. Um, I also didn't really think about college before that. I never did extracurriculars with the point of putting having them to put on my application for college. I just did stuff that I was interested in and passionate about. So I actually have volunteered at Therapeutic Riding Center since I was 11, just because I love horses and that was part of who I was. Um, same with school. I just took the classes that I was interested in and loved, mainly STEM classes. But once the college application process like became in full swing, 
for like looking at schools, which ones I want to investigate further. I asked myself, does the school have the majors I'm interested in to the level I'm interested in? Do I like the climate the school is interested in, like is located in? Because like, I'm a New Mexico girl. I like sun. I could not do, go to school in a rainy place or a place with that I was never gonna be able to get out in the winter. That's just not something I could do. I also asked myself, is it a size I would be happy at? Cause I've always gone to very small schools. So I didn't think I could handle a very large state school. And also do it, I just like its vibes in general. Would it be a place I thought I could be happy at for four years? Um, and in asking myself those, I ended up narrowing it down to four schools. Caltech, Mount Holyoke, Bryn Mawr, and Colorado State, um, Fort Collins, all for slightly different reasons. For me, I had two main criteria. Could I continue participating in with my horse? And could I do physics? So like Colorado actually has a major that's equine sciences. So well, their physics program wasn't as good. Their horses were really good. And Caltech doesn't have any horses, but they have amazing STEM. So you have to, you do have to decide like what is most important to you? What factors will make you the happiest while you spend those four years? Um, I got very lucky to do research before I was applying for college and that letter I got from that mentor had a huge effect on uh, my application. So I would say if you can find a mentor or someone that knows you and your work ethic, definitely ask them for a letter of rec. Even if it's just a teacher that you've gotten close with, their letters can make a world of difference. So I spent the fa that fall working on my essays. Since I was only applying to four schools, I spent a lot of time very ca carefully crafting each essay. And since I didn't have a ton of the traditional extracurriculars, I spent a lot of time in my essays focusing on what I'm passionate about and what matters to me. So there are quite a few about horses because they are my life outside of school. Um, and then I also showed like the connection I had between STEM and horses. I've done some projects for our horse trailer that connect like coding and my love of horses. And so I would say in your college essays, really just show that you have the passion about anything, even if it's crafting, photography, writing, running, whatever it is, show that you're passionate and because your passion will show when the admissions counselors read your essays and it will draw them in. Um, I personally did my personal essay about community and the effect that that had on me and how it made me grow as a person and how I kept growing my community as I got older and kept stepping through. Um, but there are a lot of different paths that you can use in your personal essay. Um, I also didn't have a ton of opportunities to take high level classes. So don't worry, like it's not the end of the world if your school doesn't have any APs or you didn't get to take this math class. I know a ton of people in my class that never got to take Calc BC. They just had the basic calculus understanding going into what is majorly STEM school where we're all expected to know math and stuff. And honestly, one of them is doing better than a lot of the people who already understood it. So really just try and find your passion. And if you can write about that, it will show through. Um, looking at some of the questions, uh, 
someone asked what the favorite tradition I have at college. Uh, one of my favorites is that on Halloween night at midnight, we throw super frozen pumpkins off the 13 story building on campus in an attempt to recreate the oil drop experiment, really just so we can throw things off the highest building on campus. And then another thing is during finals week, our dining will do midnight madness where at midnight they make a bunch of snacks and it's a themed like little party so everyone can celebrate and cheer up since basically everyone is awake at that time. Um, I saw some questions about pre-med. One thing I would say, I am not pre-med, I am a physics major, um, is make sure that the college you want to go to is good for pre-med. Because I know of some pre-meds at Caltech, they have hell. Because our classes are really hard. And so to try and get the very good GPA that, that med schools expect is awful for them. So if you're going trying to go the pre-med track, go to a school that like does that so you won't be dying trying to get a good enough GPA to get into med school. Um let me There's see other questions. Question. That from earlier that I thought you could probably talk about. Um, someone was asking, maybe you can give some advice as to how to do, how to get a research opportunity maybe before college or how you found yours and, and got yours, like, cause they had applied and they didn't get it. And so do you have any advice on how to do, how to do that? So there are a few ways that I think you can do this. Um, if there's a national lab near you, find a scientist that has interesting work or their um, outreach office and email them. Ask if there are any opportunities for high school students or if you're a college student for college students to do research there. Or if you're near a research university, reach out to the professors. I know some high school students who are doing research this summer at Caltech just because they reset, reached out and were like, hey, can I do research with you this summer? Um, there are also some programs, like if you're in Portland, Austin, or Santa Fe, um, they might have expanded it. The Institute for Computing and Research does a program every summer. That um, That's where I did my first research. Um, but really, just reach out. Don't be afraid to reach out. That's how you're going to find stuff. It's act, use your connections, especially your SAGE connections. It's actually my mentor for my research this past summer was a mentor at the SAGE camp I attended. So your connections, don't be afraid to reach out. They want to help you and will support you the whole way. Yeah, that's great advice because, yeah, as part of a you know, the SAGE journey, you are part of the SAGE network. And we always say, at least at Los Alamos, you, we have a general ad for, you know, high school internships, but a lot of people apply and the people who end up getting a, getting one have contacted me or other people involved in, in the camp, um, like, like Indy was saying. Um, and we, and you tell us what you're interested in. And then we try to find and reach out on your behalf, like to someone be like, Hey, I've got this, this student, are you interested in help in, in having a student this summer? So, you know, utilize your network and be proactive, just like Indy was saying. And those mentors make for great letters for your college application. And I will say also, like I applied REA to Caltech and I actually got deferred. Don't be scared of being deferred. If you get deferred, that just means they are still interested in you, but they need more information before they decide. And like I sent more information and I ended up getting in. So don't be afraid of being deferred. Also, I'm going to put my email in the chat if anyone would like to email me and ask more questions. Does anyone have any more questions I could answer now?
Um, I don't think I see any in the chat. Uh, I will follow up on something you you mentioned that, you know, we're, we're saying pro be proactive, reach out, email these people. There are going to be emails that they don't get back to you or they say no. That's happened to me a lot. Um, so, you know, everyone always talks about the success stories, but there is a lot of, you know, yeah, people <laughs> either ghosting you or saying, no, I don't have time or funding this summer. And don't let that discourage you. Um, it happens to all of us. And you just got to keep keep trying to demonstrate that grit. Um, so yeah, so don't, don't let a rejection uh, keep you from ever applying again. To add to that, college professors are also possibly the worst people at responding to email at times. They get hundreds to thousands of emails a day. So it's quite possible that your email just got lost. So if they don't respond, don't be afraid to email them again and say like, hey, just checking in, is there an opportunity? Because it's very possible that your email just got lost. And I know that at least I've definitely heard of people not getting responses just because the professors and people get so many emails that they don't see them. So don't be afraid to send a follow up because it very possibly could be they never knew you emailed them. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining. And I know we're running a little late, so thank you for, for sticking around. Um, I guess, um, so we do have a presence on social media as Sage. Um, it's at Sage's Camp, S-A-G-E-S, C-A-M-P, um, and we do this every month with a different topic, and the plan for our October um, session is paid internships. So we talked a little bit about how to get, do like a, a research job over the summer, um, and so we'll be talking about some more information about that if you're interested. Um, I guess, Daniela, was there anything you wanted to say before we close? No, no, thank you very much to our wonderful speakers. Thank you for joining us this morning. And I will be in touch with you soon regarding the October internships. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, no problem. Bye.